I hear a train whistle at 2.14 a.m. every night. Every night I hear the train. A few days ago, we moved into a house 500 feet from the tracks. What a mistake that was. Every night, without fail, at exactly 2.14 a.m., the train rumbles by, laying on the horn like no tomorrow. Woo-woo. And then, last night, it sounded closer. At 2.14 a.m. on the dot, I heard the familiar cry of the whistle. Hey, does it sound louder to you? Sounds as loud as it always does, David groaned. Why did we get a house so close to the train? This is torture. Because it was cheaper. I'd rather eat ramen for the next two years than listen to that whistle. Woo, woo. It's louder, much louder. I walked to the window, peering through the blinds. I could just barely see the train whooshing past, behind the houses across the street. Bless those poor souls living closer to the tracks than we did. Maybe they got a new whistle, David said. Oh no, I hope not. Or maybe the air's clearer tonight, I don't know. The rustling of sheets as David rolled over. Go to sleep. I stared out into the darkness, watching the train. Silver flickered between the gaps in the houses. Red lights streaked by. The whistle sounded again, softer now, as the train was almost past. And then it was gone. I walked back to bed and pulled the covers tightly over me. Sharm Chen. The next night, it was even louder. Woo woo! I groaned and glanced at the clock. 2.14 a.m. Man, whoever drives this train is extremely punctual. I rolled over, tried to ignore it, but the sound bored into my head like a drill. Woo woo! And the pauses between the whistles were more agonizing than the sound itself, dreading the next jolting. Awful woo woo was like some sort of cruel and unusual psychological punishment. That damned whistle, David snapped. The whistle must have really pissed him off. David rarely swore, if ever. It was a thing of pride to him, I thought, though he wouldn't admit it. Yeah, sucks, doesn't it? Yeah, and you're right, it does sound louder, David said, rolling towards me. And you know what? I've never seen that train during the day. It's like it's trying to wake everyone up. Huh. That was a weird thought. He was right. I'd never heard it in the daytime, but there must be some explanation for that. Right? I'm no train expert, but don't some freight trains only run at night? So they don't have to worry about cars piling up at the train crossings? Maybe it only runs at night, I said. What? Only one train runs on those tracks at 2.14 a.m.? Makes no sense. I walked over to the window again. There it was, coasting through the darkness, the metallic thrumming of the wheels rumbling through the air. Then the whistle. Woo woo. The houses across the street were all dark, undisturbed by the noise right behind them. Maybe in time, we'd get used to it, too. That morning was difficult. I fumbled through my morning routine, almost brushing my teeth with anti-itch cream. As I walked out into the driveway, I saw one of our older neighbors in her pink jumpsuit, doing a morning walk, energetic and spry, which seemed almost superhuman this morning. Good morning she said with a bright smile. Good morning, I replied. Nah. She was almost out of sight when I remembered she lived in the house across the street, right in front of the train tracks. Hey, Gertrude, I called. Yes, dear? Didn't the train keep you up last night? Her smile didn't waver. No, dear. Didn't even hear a train last night. Really? You didn't? I stopped. She'd already turned around, power walking her way around the bend. I sighed and got in the car. Work was physically painful. Just keeping my head from flopping on the desk was a struggle. My brain was in a fog despite the two cups of coffee I downed, and I made no progress on the report due Tuesday. When I pulled into the driveway at 5 p.m., I knew what I had to do. I was going to look at the train tracks. I don't know why I did it exactly. I guess it's for the same reason people want to see the face of the masked man who mugged them or broke into their home. Somehow. Coming face to face with your tormentor is oddly satisfying. But nothing prepared me for what I found. <laughs> I walked straight across the road and between two houses, hoping no one saw me. I was technically trespassing, probably. To my left, there was a little plastic slide in the backyard, 
just a few feet from the tree line in front of the tracks. What? Someone lets their kids play out here? So close to the tracks? I glanced at the other backyard. It held a cute little patio area, which, again, was pretty close to the tracks. Boy, these people had really gotten used to the train. I trudged ahead, to the tree line. Beyond, I could see the space where the train flew by every night. My pulse quickened. This was the moment. I stepped into the underbrush, took a deep breath, and peered out. My heart stopped. The tracks were abandoned, twisted, overgrown, cracked. The wood was rotten and splintered. Wayward weeds and even small shrubs had burst up through the space between the railroad ties. I looked left, then right. The tracks extended in either direction, three muddy feet below me, as far as the eye could see. But it wasn't a clean tunnel through the underbrush. Branches poked out into the area, and the foliage crept forward, ready to overtake the tracks. Excuse me, a voice said behind me. I whipped around. A tired mother stood behind me, her hair in a messy bun, holding the hand of a three-year-old girl. Can I help you with something? she asked. More of a warning than a question. I... Sorry, I just... The tracks there. Do trains ever come by? She shook her head. No, they've been abandoned for a good five years. But I've been hearing a train, every night at 2.14 a.m. The woman's face paled. You should go, she said hurriedly. Then she turned around and swiftly walked back into her house, dragging her daughter behind her. When I got back to the house, David was already there, eating leftover pasta for dinner. David, I said breathlessly, the tracks are abandoned. He stared at me, stopping midway through a bite of pasta. What? The train tracks across the street, they're abandoned. No train's been on them for five years. That's impossible. We hear that train every night. Well, no trains have been there. There are weeds everywhere, and the trees. I said, that's impossible. He suddenly slammed his fist down on the table. The silverware rattled. All I could do was stare. David was always soft-spoken. Never raised his voice. Never swore. Hitting the table, or anything for that matter, was something I couldn't even picture him doing. There must be a train using the abandoned tracks, he continued, in a tone of forced calm. Maybe illegally. He stabbed at the pasta across from me in silence, keeping his eyes on his food. My heart throbbed in my chest. David, are you okay? I ventured. Of course, he said, not looking up. Okay. I picked up my dish and brought it to the sink. The rush of water drowned out the uncomfortable silence, and I was thankful. Then I set it down next to the sink, dried my hands, and glanced at the clock. 8.27 p.m. Only five hours and 47 minutes until the train. Shaken. When I finally went to sleep, I couldn't fall asleep for hours because I knew that stupid whistle was going to wake me up. But somehow, I must have, because at exactly 2.14 a.m., I woke up. Not to the train whistle, to a loud rumbling sound. I shot up. David, what is that? My hands fell on empty covers. David? Woo woo! The whistle pierced the air, so loud it hurt my ears. I jumped out of bed, ran across the room. David, where are you? I froze as red light flashed through the blinds. What the hell is going on? The sound, the noise. It was like the train was going by right outside our window, like it would crash into our house at any moment, flatten and crush us to pieces. I finally tore my eyes away, yanked the door open and charged out into the hallway. David? He was just standing there, in the guest bedroom, in front of the window, still as a statue. The red light flashed across his face as he stared out. That fucking train, he said in a hoarse whisper. A chill coursed through me. I approached him slowly, my heart pounding in his chest. His expression was hard to make out in the darkness. I only saw the red light sparkling in his eyes. David, are you okay? That fucking train, he repeated. I joined him at the window, my whole body shaking. But the train, 
it was where it always was, whooshing by behind the houses across the street. No, there's no way it could have made so much noise from all the way over there. Now, the noise was queeter, back to normal. David, come on, let's go back to sleep. My heart pounded, waiting for him to speak. Instead, he silently followed me back into the bedroom. He climbed up into the bed, pulled the covers over himself, and didn't say a word. I stared at the ceiling, sleep the last thing from my mind. We both slept in that Saturday. By the time I rolled over and looked at the clock, it was almost noon. Hey, sleepyhead. I turned to see David laying there, a smile on his face. Hey. Memories of last night flooded back to me, and my smile faded. Last night? You seemed out of it. Are you feeling okay? I'm fine, he replied, pulling me close. And I believed him. I really did. Because I'm a sentimental fool, blindly in love, I don't know. The rest of the day was wonderful, just a lazy, rainy day with David, laughing and watching shows. But after the sunset, he grew agitated. I have something to get done, he snapped, after dinner. Then he stormed upstairs to his study, and I didn't see him again until I went to bed around 11. By then, he was fast asleep, lying still and facing away from me. Breaths slow and rhythmic. As expected, I woke up a few hours later with a start, but as I sat up in bed only silence filled my ears. No train whistle, no rumbling. I glanced at the clock. 2.10 a.m. Huh, that's weird, I've never woken up before. The train. That's when I noticed the bed was empty. Again. David? I climbed out of bed, ran down the hallway. But this time, he wasn't in the guest room. I charged down the stairs. David? Where are you? Motion caught my eye through the dining room window. A man crossing the street. David. What the hell is he doing? Against my better judgment, I pulled the door open and walked down the front steps. By the time I got to the road, he was already slipping into the shadows between two houses, heading right towards the tracks. David! I yelled. He didn't turn around. I broke into a run. I couldn't see him anymore. The moonlight didn't make it into the gap between the houses. I made it to the grass, tiptoed through the alley, and fought through the brambles at the tree line. Nah. He stood with his back to me, at the edge of the tracks, still as a statue. The moonlight glinted off his hair, outlining him in silver light. David? I asked softly. One minute, he replied without turning around. One minute? Until the train. David, this is insane. We shouldn't be out here. It's late, and this is someone else's property. I reached for his arm. As soon as my fingers touched his skin, he jerked away. Come on, we have to go back inside. What are you hoping to do anyway? Stop the train? I scoffed. You've been acting really weird, David, and it's honestly scaring me a little. Good. Then it all happened so fast. He whipped around and grabbed my shoulders. With a simple pivot, he swung me in front of him, and then threw me down onto the tracks. The impact of the metal shot up through my hips, my arms, my back. I fought my way up, feet slipping over the rotten railroad ties. David, what the hell are you doing? Now I could finally see his face. He stared straight ahead, as if focused on something far away. His lips were turned up in a smirk. Thirty seconds, he said, softly. David? Woo woo. The faint whistle of the train. Followed by a soft rumble that I felt vibrate through the metal under my feet. A pair of white lights twinkled in the darkness, like twin stars, getting closer, impossibly fast. I screamed and lunged for the forest, but the ground was three feet above me, three muddy, steep feet. I sunk a foot into the ground, grabbed for a branch near the edge to hoist myself up, and David shoved me back down. Woo woo! The lights were close now, glaring through the darkness, blindingly bright. The vibrations traveled through the rails, through my body, as it rumbled closer. Woo woo! The whistle was loud now, deafeningly loud. 
I launched myself towards the forest, scrambling for purchase. I can't die here. I can't. The train is coming and, oh God, it's so close. I could feel the wind rustling my hair, the heat coming off it, the rumble suffusing through every part of my body. I sunk my foot in the earth again, clawing my way up. The wind whooshed at my back. A hand grabbed mine, but instead of shoving me back, it pulled me up. And then we were running. Through the underbrush, the shadows blurring and tilting around me. Woo woo! The train rocketed past behind us in a gust of wind. Red light flit over the grass and the rumble filled my ears. Are you okay? A mess of brown hair, a young face. It wasn't David. It was the mother I'd encountered yesterday. The one who told me the tracks were abandoned. I, my husband, I don't know what he... She squeezed my hand and looked into my eyes. Don't worry. He can't hurt you now. I stared at her, my heart pounding. What are you saying? The train only takes the ones who will hurt, she replied, her voice melting into the thunder of the train. But David would have hurt you sooner or later. It was only a matter of time. The train only brings out what is already there. I glanced back at the train. Silver streaked through the branches, red lights flashed, but there was no silhouette standing next to it. David was gone. Where, where is it going? I asked, my heart throbbing in my chest. She looked at me grimly in the darkness.